Welcome back everyone. This is the third video in our mini series on Dante's Inferno. Uh, hopefully you've already watched the second video because if not our entire discussion of the second half of the first canto is not going to make any sense. So please do make sure that you go re-watch that if it's been a while or if you haven't watched it please do go ahead and watch that. So before we go ahead and dive into the last set of verses for Canto 1, I want to draw your attention to the focus question you'll find on page 739 of your textbook. And it's always important to make sure that we read through these focus questions to make sure that we're not looking at a text without a clear understanding of our purpose. And the focus question says this, driven back into the dark woods, Dante meets the spirit of Virgil. Read to find out why Virgil is a good guide for the lost poet. So we've already talked a little bit about Virgil in terms of who he is, but now we're going to get a more in-depth look into details about his life, why he is in the inferno in the first place, and more importantly, what Dante's perspective of Virgil is. So we're going to follow the same format as the last video. So I'm going to read through uh, lines 46 through 109 aloud. Uh, you can go ahead and follow along in your textbook. You'll find that on page 739 through 741. And then we're going to jump back and using the worksheets that I've linked to in agenda on lesson, we're going to analyze in depth the deeper meaning of these tercets. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. While I was ruining myself back down to the deep, Someone appeared, one who seemed nearly to fade, as though from long silence. I cried to this human shape in that great wasteland. Living man or shade, have pity and help me, whichever you may be. No living man, though once I was, he replied. My parents were both Mantuans from Lombardy, and I was born sub Julio, the latter end. I lived in good Augustus's Rome, in the day of the false gods who lied. A poet, I hymned Anchises' noble son, who came from Troy, when superb Ilium and its pride was burned. But you, why go back down to such misery? Why not ascend the delightful mountain, source and principle that causes every joy? Then are you Virgil? Are you the font that pours so overwhelming a river of human speech? I answered, shamefaced. The glory and light are yours, that poets follow. May the love that made me search your book in patient study avail me, master. You are my guide and author, whose verses teach the graceful style whose model has done me honor. See this beast driving me backward? Help me resist, for she makes all my veins and pulses shudder. A different path from this one would be best for you to find your way from this feral place, he answered, seeing how I wept. This beast... The cause of your complaint lets no one pass her way, but harries all to death. Her nature is so malign and vicious, she cannot appease her ferocity, for feeding makes her hungrier. Many are the beasts she mates. There will be more, until the hound comes, who will give this creature a painful death. Not nourished by earthly fare, he will be fed by wisdom, goodness, and love. Born between Feltro and Feltro, he shall restore Low Italy, as nice a spot to achieve, and Turnus, Aurelius, Camilla the Maiden, all dead from wounds and war. He will remove this lean wolf, hunting her through every region till he has thrust her back to hell's abyss, where envy first dispatched her on her mission. Therefore, I judge it best that you should choose to follow me, and I will be your guide away from here and through an eternal place. To hear the cries of despair, and to behold ancient tormented spirits as they lament in chorus the second death they must abide. Then you shall see those souls who are content to dwell in fire, because they hope some day to join the blessed, toward whom, if your ascent continues, your guide will be one worthier than I. When I must leave you, you will be with her. For the emperor who governs from on high wills I not enter his city where none may appear who lived like me in rebellion to his law. His empire is everything and everywhere, but then is his kingdom, his city, his seat of awe. Happy is the soul he chooses for that place. I, 
Poet, please, by the God you did not know, help me escape this evil that I face, and worse. Lead me to witness what you have said, St. Peter's Gate, in the multitudes of woes. Then he set out, and I followed where he led. Let's begin then by taking a look at Dante in the midst of his retreat. So recall from the end of our last video that we discussed Dante being driven back by this final beast, the she-wolf, and how she is representative of these deepest layers in hell, these sins of treachery, of deceit, and betrayal. And so Dante admits in shame that he has to run back. There's no way he can ascend the hill on his own. And this is where we're going to see Virgil first appear. And when Dante is going back down the hill, he is in his retreat, he first looks upon Virgil. He doesn't know it's Virgil yet. And he sees a ghostly figure, someone not of an earthly realm whatsoever. And so the things that we need to recall or understand here is that Dante admits that what he's doing is completely disastrous. You'll see in your textbook on page 739, footnote number 46, that ruining here means falling into ruin or disaster. So he's setting himself up for failure and Dante is completely aware of this. But again, uh, Dante sees something, and this halts him in the midst of his retreat, and it puts almost this pause on the despair that he's feeling. And then he decides to call out to this shade. So not perhaps yours or my first <laughs> instinct in a dark woods after being faced by three ferocious beasts, but literally Dante has no other option to call out to. So he begins to speak to this shade. He says, living man or shade, so addressing the fact that this is not a person, most likely. And he is asking for help, and the shade, this ghostly figure, replies to him, and he clarifies that your first instinct was right, so I'm no longer a living man, but once I was. So here we're going to know that Dante recognizes that this is a ghost rather than a person, in fact, and that this figure, although now dead, was very much alive. And then we get into the third person on this slide, and we start to get clues as to the identity of this person. So if you've ever played the game uh, Guess Who when you were younger, this is Dante's version of Guess Who. So we're, get, we're given hints that if we're very aware of Roman history, would automatically tell us that the person that he meets here, this ghostly shade, is in fact Virgil. So referencing the area of his ancestry, Lombardy, so a city in northern Italy, born under the time of Julius Caesar, so during his reign, and also under the reign of Augustus, who is in fact the grand nephew of Julius Caesar. So all of these, uh, the location and roughly the, the date or time, would have been a huge hint that this figure is in fact Virgil. Turning then to your worksheet, you know from our focus question that we're focusing on why is Virgil the best guide for Dante? And to do that, I want to look at the characteristics that are displayed in Dante, both Dante the Pilgrim and Dante the Poet. And comparing that to the characteristics of Virgil, because often we're going to see that the weaknesses or the faults that we see in Dante are addressed by Virgil himself. So what we see about Dante is this, that he is in full retreat mode and he is in a state of despair. He realizes that he needs help and a great deal of it. And this is where Virgil comes in. So although he is a ghost, so he's a human shade, so not a living person anymore. Uh, he is going to be in a particularly well-placed position to help Dante, okay? So he comes from a more ancient version of Italy. So in that respect, Dante and Virgil are in somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, or in some sense, kindred spirits, right? So they're both from the same place, just set apart by time. And this is going to be helpful because that allows them to relate better to one another. Jumping back in then to our next set of tercets, we see that Virgil continues to describe 
things about him uh, when he was alive, further hints that we should understand who this person is before Dante reveals his name. So again, we have these hints appearing here that tell us that this person is a poet, someone who would have lived under a time when ancient Rome still was very much into pagan worship or this idea of worshiping a multitude of gods. And the poet indicates that he is the author of a poem centered around Troy and what happens to the city of Troy after it's defeated by the Greeks. So this, for us, should be a huge indication about who this person is, in part because we have discussed Virgil slightly in class before when I was introducing the Iliad. So it should be familiar in terms of what time period we're discussing, so discussing ancient Rome, but also discussing the only other ancient poet who really tackles this subject aside from Homer, and that is Virgil himself. Continuing on, now we see that Virgil begins to directly address Dante, and he asks him uh, what for us seems like a stupid question, because we understand why Dante has been driven back. But perhaps this is Virgil wanting to get more information, or even to help Dante realize for himself what really causes him to be driven back, right? Sort of these rhetorical questions, not so much wanting an accurate answer, but wanting Dante to figure out or to process what's really going on. And then we're going to see that Dante answers him. Then are you Virgil? So immediately Dante knows who this person is. And this is one of the instances in the canto and in, in the Inferno as a whole, really, that we see Dante slipping vo into a different voice. So moving away from Dante as the pilgrim into Dante as the poet, because Dante the poet is going to be the one who has full knowledge of who Virgil is. And he admits as much, right? And he begins by giving such words of praise to Virgil even going so far as to say the glory and the light are yours in reference to poetry. Okay. Jumping back then to our worksheet, we're going through the same process again. So understanding the characteristics of Dante that he reveals about himself and then how these characteristics are aligned with the characteristics of Virgil. So the first is this intense love for Virgil as a poet. He reveres him but also this idea of a conscious fear in the face of his idol, right? Imagine someone who you greatly look up to and meeting them for the first time in a moment of shame for yourself. You're running away from a problem, right? Or you're, you're going through something very uh, difficult and troubling and disastrous. And this is when Dante first meets his idol. And we're gonna see that Virgil treats him with kindness in the tercets to follow. And we even see that a little bit here, right? That Virgil is asking him kindly through these rhetorical questions, why are you turning back? Why do you not face your fear? We're gonna continue now and look at how Dante continues to show his love for Virgil. And we see that very, very clearly in this first tercet here. He refers to him as his master, his guide and author. And this is just to show that the work of Virgil in terms of his poetry served as a great model for Dante. And here, Dante fully accepts him as both a guide through these times of trouble, but also as a guide in terms of helping Dante become the poet who he is. And this continues here in this next tercet, right? So again, paying homage or honor to Virgil's style. But also in this same sentence, or the same verse, addressing and identifying that it's in fact the she-wolf who has driven him back, the sin of betrayal and treachery. And again, we never want to lose sight that this is an allegory. So when Dante is talking about the she-wolf that drives him back, it's not just from a literal sense. Yes, that's what's happening in the plot. But thinking of a more figurative meaning, it's his portrayed treachery from Pope Boniface VIII, who really drives him out of this place of righteousness in uh, a spiritual state of well-being in the city of Florence. 
And this continues in the last tercet. So here we switch back to Virgil addressing Dante, and he is going to provide a solution for Dante's problem. So he sees Dante weeping, and he's going to take compassion on him in a sense and help him wake up to the fact that he needs to find a different way to escape, that he cannot stay here. This is also important though because the fact that we see Dante openly weeping in front of Virgil is going to introduce us to one instance of many where we're going to see his human side, that there are going to be weaknesses in Dante that Virgil is going to address. And here he addresses them kindly, but at times we're going to learn that he needs to address them harshly to get Dante to wake up to the disaster that is his reality. Again, turning back to our worksheet then, she continued to identify these characteristics of Dante. And one of the huge characteristics we see is that he is more of a follower than a leader. So he immediately refers to Virgil as his master, as his guide and author. Again, not just in terms of how he writes his poetry, but also in terms of helping him escape from the grim defile. We also see that his open love for Virgil continues. He says that your model has done me honor. So everything that Dante is as a poet, he attributes in a sense to Virgil. But again, we're also conscious of the fear that Dante has, and he himself is conscious of it. Turning then to Virgil, Virgil, we see, genuinely desires to help Dante. He looks upon his weeping and tells him that there's a different path that you must take, and he's about to tell Dante what this path is. Virgil now is going to continue to explain to Dante why the she-wolf is so successful in driving him back. And we might be thinking to ourselves, well, Dante already knows this, he's explained this to us. But remember, Dante the poet is telling this story in retrospect, meaning he's already gone through it and he's going back in time to tell it to us. So it's really not that Dante knew why she was so successful in that first half of Canto One, it's that he realizes this information from Virgil, who has this knowledge of the supernatural. And we see that Virgil describes her as a creature who is insatiable in terms of her hunger and her appetite, and that no one can get past her. And again, we're still remembering that the she-wolf isn't just a she-wolf. She represents these deepest, darkest sins, this sins of treachery and betrayal that comprise the eighth and ninth circles of hell, according to Dante. Okay. So more evidence for why the she-wolf is so terrifying and why nothing can deter her. And Virgil continues to explain this more, not just for Dante's sake, but for ours, right? Because we need to clearly understand why Dante is not capable, either from a physical sense in terms of literally getting past her, but also in a spiritual sense, why he is unable to conquer his fear of her. And in fact, we realize that Virgil explains that it's not Dante's job at all to be able to conquer the she-wolf or to defeat her, that we have this figure of the hound who is going to come and who is going to be the one responsible for ridding the world of her in the first place. Okay. So a few things to note here. This type of sin, these deep sins of treachery and betrayal, we get this sense that feeding only leads to wanting more. So when we're in those deepest darkest types of sins, being successful with them, gaining something from them only encourages and increases our desire. This is what Dante is saying. Okay? And also that it's responsible for spreading other types of sin. However, we also begin to see a picture of hope, that this hound is going to come and rid the world of her. And here, Virgil is going to get into, again, this guessing game of what sort of characteristics of the hound should help me understand who this person or who this figure is. And Dante tells us that this hound is not fed by any earthly fare, meaning not anything that you and I would consume or eat, but it's fed by wisdom, by goodness and love. 
So these are going to be characteristics that define and make up the hound. Also, this person, this figure, is going to be born between Feltro and Feltro. And here I want to remind you of your textbook because it does a really good job in terms of clarifying those terms we need to understand to know what sort of symbolic picture Dante is painting. And here on page 740, if you go down to the footnote for lines 78 to 81, it says this, The hound may be con grande de la scala, who supported Dante in exile and who was born in Verona between the cities of Feltre and Fel Montefeltro. Okay, so here, if we're trying to think of a real person that the hound could represent, your textbook and many experts uh, give this figure of Con Grande de la Scala as a good example. Okay, again, if we want to go the spiritual route, if we look at these characteristics of someone being fed by wisdom, by goodness, by love, someone who is going to once and for all defeat sin. This should immediately uh, place into our minds a figure of Jesus. So again, not forgetting the fact that we're analyzing this in terms of it being an allegory. We're gonna jump then to our worksheet. Okay, always make sure you have that with you side by side as you're taking notes. And I really don't have anything new to add for Dante, and that's because Dante doesn't speak very much in the terses that we went over. So we have a lot to cover in terms of Virgil then. One of the things we realize is that he has intimate knowledge of the evil that exists. And this is going to be important because Virgil is going to be the one who fills Dante in on everything that's going on in the Inferno. So we're going to see a lot of supernatural things, and Virgil is going to be in the know about them. So we learn about them through him, just as Dante does. But also, he has a knowledge of good ultimately overcoming evil. More evidence, again, that Virgil is given knowledge above and beyond the knowledge that Dante has. But then also, more evidence that this poem ultimately will end on a happy note. Now we still are looking at Virgil in terms of his speaking. And remember, he's continuing to talk about how the hound is going to defeat the she-wolf ultimately by the end of the, the story, okay? So here he's giving figures, and I want you to turn to your textbook to get a better idea of who these people are. Again, looking at page 740, and you have a footnote at the very bottom of the page that says this. These are characters in Virgil's Aeneid who die in the war between the Trojans and the Latins. Okay, Latins just being a reference to the Greeks. So this is important because all of these characters in Virgil's Aeneid die for the sake of Troy. Okay? Again, evidence, if we're analyzing who the hound might be on a spiritual level, that it very well could be Jesus, this idea of a figure who dies for the sake of others. Okay? Again, we have Virgil continuing to talk about the defeat of the she-wolf. And here, Virgil is describing the fact the hound will be the one to send the she-wolf back to hell's abyss, meaning the very depths of hell where envy first dispatched her on her mission. Now, something I want you to note and pay attention to. Anytime you see a word that is capitalized, we understand that it's a proper now, okay, talking about words that are not capitalized because they are the first in the sentence. So here, the fact that we see envy is capitalized should draw our attention to the fact that it's not just talking about the feeling or emotion of envy, but envy as personified, envy being a figure, a character. So we need to think then, who might the she-wolf represent? Who does envy? represent. We're going to discuss that in a moment, okay? But one of the things I want to draw your attention to is that just as the hound stood for a real-life figure, right? Many experts claim that perhaps this person was con grande de la scala. The she-wolf has the same role. And if we're thinking about a figure, 
who in Dante's life was the epitome or the personification of treachery and betrayal, we need look no further than Pope Boniface VIII, right? So the person who is behind Dante's exile and who Dante believes to be the ruin of Florence, the city that he loves so much. Then we come to the final tercet on this slide, and here we see that Virgil agrees to be Dante's guide. So this again is going to characterize for us the fact that Virgil is going to be of a great help to Dante. So there's not a whole lot to say uh, about Dante in terms of his characteristics. Perhaps one of the things that you could note is the fact that he does pull from his real life sorrows to enhance the divine comedy. So he very creatively weaves in figures throughout the Inferno. And here we see how he weaves in Pope Boniface VIII and how he basically places him uh, as the, the worst of all sinners. And we're gonna return to uh, this idea and see how he places him in one of the lowest circles of hell in fact. But I want to turn to Virgil. Again, we have this continued idea of Virgil understanding that good is going to overcome evil and knowing that he's been given this supernatural knowledge from somewhere, but also that he genuinely desires to help Dante. We see that in the fact that he says, I will be your guide. And now I want to draw your attention to the first Tercet because here, Dante is being told about, in essence, the inferno, what they're about to walk into. And here, when Virgil's talking about this second death they must abide, this is the torture that we're going to see these sinners experiencing in each layer of hell. Then he moves to the second level that Dante and he will have to go through. And this is going to be purgatory or purgatorio, that second part of the Divine Comedy. So this idea of being tested through fire, so earning your way out of purgatory or out of this sort of waiting room to get into heaven through having to experience pain. And then finally, and this is the moment that we've been waiting for in terms of why are we not seeing Beatrice yet? Here you have her, and Virgil is saying that once they get out of purgatory, before they go to paradise, he is going to hand her off to a guide even worthier than Virgil. And this is important, okay? because remember, Dante the poet is placing all of these words into Virgil's mouth. So we understand how deeply Dante admires Virgil. Even more than that, he admires Beatrice. Okay? And this her that he refers to is speaking of her. Now we have a lot of characteristics to talk about in terms of Dante, but the primary one I want to draw your attention to is the fact that he places Beatrice, his courtly love, as his guide through paradise where she resides. So he loves her so much that he places her automatically in heaven. Remember, historically, she dies well before Dante begins to write the Divine Comedy. So he envisions her as being in heaven before the throne of God. And I want to recall your attention to something that I said in the very first video and that I've also mentioned in class, that when Dante wrote La Vita Nuova, those set of sonnets for Beatrice, the very last thing he writes there is that he confesses that everything that he has written up until now about her has been completely and utterly unworthy of her. And he says that I'm going to put down my pen until I can think of something to write about her that is worthy of her. And guys, we have finally got there. So he writes the Divine Comedy, places Beatrice in heaven. She is one of the central figures that guides him out of his spiritual despair. And this is important because we need to remember that, again, this is not just an allegory, not just an autobiography of Dante's life, but ultimately, as well, a love story, because we see how he continually confesses his love for her. Then, on the flip side, we have Virgil. 
So again, this continued intimate knowledge of the evil that exists and knowledge that he's going to pass along to Dante and by extension us as well. And here we see Virgil getting into detail, describing the kingdom of God. Okay, think back to your Bible lessons. And he talks about the kingdom of God uh, in very ideal, idyllic terms, right? It's paradise. Yeah. So then we have Dante addressing Virgil again, and he says this, but I want to draw your attention. You'll see I circled in yellow I, and you see that Dante, rather than saying I said, just places a colon, and you're going to see that a lot of times throughout the inferno. So just whenever you see I or he with a colon, it's simply referencing that the person is now beginning to speak. And so Virgil also uses language relating to God and heaven to ask Virgil for help. But this is also evidence for us to understand from now uh, that Virgil, as someone who did not know God, yeah, as someone who back in ancient times worshipped many gods, according to Dante, he is not going to be in paradise with Beatrice, but he will actually be a resident of the inferno, a resident of hell. And we'll see that he resides in that very first circle, which is reserved for people in limbo. And we'll get into a uh, discussion about who those people are in the next video. Okay. Not a whole lot to discuss here in this last verse. So what I really want to draw your attention to uh, is the last set of words that he says, I followed where he led. So again, evidence that Dante very readily takes on this role of someone who is passive, someone who is a follower rather than a leader. The last thing I want you to talk about or to take note of for your worksheet is again this idea that Dante is going to follow Virgil around wherever he goes. And that while this is a good thing because Virgil is the one who's helping him out of the inferno, it also at times is going to reveal this side of Dante where he is not really actively taking responsibility for his role in the journey. On the flip side of that, uh, Virgil's genuine desire to help Dante. So we've come to the end of the first canto. Just to make sure that you can test yourself, that you understand um, what we've discussed, those main points we've highlighted. These are three questions that I'd like you to answer on your own. Now you can type them up, write them down in your copy book, and um, just send them to me if you'd like me to, to take a look at them. But these are the questions. One, how does Dante feel about himself at the beginning of the story? So how does he feel about his physical state, his spiritual state? Question two, what is Dante's attitude toward Virgil? So how does he see Virgil as a person? What sort of language does he use to describe him, to speak with him? Does he hold him in high esteem? Things like that. And then the last question, what do you predict might happen to Dante on his journey through hell? So question number three is entirely predicting based on what we understand about Dante, his weaknesses and perhaps his strengths. What do we think is going to happen to him as he continues to journey with Virgil through these layers of hell? You can find those questions on the slide in front of you or if you're opening your textbook on page 741. Thanks for listening, guys, and I will post the next video soon where we'll dive into canto number three.